Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session about numeric sufficiency as software. We have our first speaker ready here in the room, presenting live, Mr. Yerasimus Hurdakis. You have 20 minutes, and the floor is yours. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. My name is Yerasimus Hurdakis, and I would like to talk to you about I'd like to talk to you about um, a coupling library we're developing, uh, which is called Precise and you may have heard of. I would like to start uh, with a problem-specific question that is, how would you simulate a nuclear reactor? This is a complex system that, um, yeah, you probably don't want to start simulating it with doing full CFT in the complete system. This could be um, rather complicated. Instead, uh, my at the uh, German Nuclear Reactor Safety Institute have developed a 1D code, uh, which is also finite volumes, and it's called um, Athlete. And uh, they have applying it, they have been applying it uh, very successfully to simulate nuclear reactor accidents for uh, several years. However, uh, they are now thinking, what if we could actually uh, replace a part of our uh, simulation with uh, something more high fidelity. And the other there is, of course, open foam. So, why uh, do they want to do uh, such coupled simulations? They have some multi physics problems, for example, conjugate heat transfer. They have this 1D representation of three pipelines, and not only they want to come with more complex flow regions, but they also want to be able to couple it with complex 3D uh, solids around, um, around the pipes to uh, simulate the actual uh, cooling. And uh, for this, they want to essentially couple a fleet uh, with different solvers. Previously, they have done this uh, with their uh, own uh, internal coupling, uh, for example, couple to open foam or uh, CFX. And uh, my collaborator, Joachim Herb, has also presented such a coupling previously, for example, in Zagreb. The long-term goal, however, is to have a plug-and-play solution where you don't need to develop new code every time you want to, to couple a new external code. So what they are doing right now is that uh, they have their code athlete, which they have also encoded they have transformed into a library that can be by some script. And they have created a Python interface, which is also very convenient for us. Pulse um, athlete, pulse other solvers. And the other solvers here are, for example. This is something that uh, you may see often uh, being applied as a pattern when people want to couple software. But this. Um, becomes cumbersome in more complex scenarios, for example, when you want to couple more than two participants. And here's where, when, where I come in, because in our group, we have, seen, we have developed a coupling library called Precise, which is uh, this uh, uh, green box in the middle. Essentially, uh, you call from your solver, so you can call this library from or from Calculix or from Athlete. And this will make sure that uh, you have good spatial interpolation between the two meshes that don't need to conform or anything. You have methods that uh, radial base function there. Make sure that communication is efficient. So if open foam scales on a supercomputer, this will not prevent you for, from still scaling. And uh, it also provides you coupling algorithms uh, that can make uh, the two sides of the interface really converge and converge fast. So in principle, this is very simple. You just have to modify your code to add a few library calls to read and write data and call um, uh, all this uh, uh, call uh, precise to execute these coupling algorithms. Do not change in your code. Um, 
Okay, so for now we currently uh, support many uh, many solvers, not only OpenFoam, which is uh, what most of our users are currently using, but also uh, many of the codes that you find there. And uh, the nice thing is that you can also add it to your project. It supports any programming language that your code may be uh, written into. So clearly, our community comes more from fluid structure interaction, conjugate heat transfer, porous media, and so on, uh, where people do not uh, use open foam to simulate the whole thing, but they couple open foam with some other solver. All right, so zooming into um, the specific project again, this is how uh, we want to, to see a plug and play multi-physics problem uh, with athlete. That we have this 1D thermohydraulics, and then uh, we can, at runtime, choose, okay, I want to couple it with uh, that CFD code, which is code, uh, or with some other solid uh, code for heat transfer. And uh, what we need to develop, essentially, is uh, this additional small uh, box that is an adapter. This is essentially the code that calls the library. So instead of having to write the code yourself, that in OpenFoam, for example, you have a function object that calls the library for you so that you can just choose it at runtime. Um, this is part of uh, uh, what I'm doing in my PhD. This is one, one application that we are uh, doing in collaboration uh, with uh, GRS. And we start uh, with a very simple, uh, completely manufactured case. Uh, we just take a pipe, we split it into two, and we want to make the two uh, sides talk to each other. So what you see here is uh, really a very coarse representation of a pipe. You have just 10, uh, 10 cells here, and you have a time-dependent uh, mass flux and enthalpy at the inlet, a single phase flow, and uh, yeah, you, you fix the pressure at the end and the temperature. Then uh, we say, okay, first of all, we need to enable athlete to be coupled with precise. So we cut it into the middle and we have two pipes. We start two athlete simulations. We make them communicate. We exchange uh, mass fluxes. So athlete does not talk in the language of velocities, but in the language of mass flows. And we read uh, pressure and temperatures. And um, now, uh, let's, let's look at, the, at some first results. We plot here over space, the pressure and the temperature. And I have to tell you here that we're using a very simplistic uh, staggered uh, scheme, meaning that uh, the one uh, solver is uh, one step behind on the other. Here you see the transient phase. So that's why you have the small um, uh, desynchronization. Of course, you can also apply parallel schemes. Uh, this is not, not a problem, but here we're still dealing with, uh, with the technicalities. So we see that, uh, yeah, generally this is, uh, uh, this is working. So the two sides uh, communicate uh, finally and so on. <coughs> Over time, you see you have this uh, transient. And what you still need to notice here is that uh, you see two black lines that are two, monolith, uh, two points in the monolithic simulation uh, because when we split the, the pipe, we are essentially uh, here tracking mostly for visualization purposes, uh, the cell centers of the two, like the last, uh, the cell center of the outlet and the cell center of the inlet. So they have a small um, uh, distance. Generally, we are capturing the, the features of the flow and we say, okay, we can uh, move to uh, what we actually want to do, which is replace, um, one of the athlete instances with one open foam instance. And here uh, we essentially simulate the same thing, but replace uh, one of the athlete, uh, the, the right uh, side that we were simulating with athlete, we now replace it with open foam, specifically with pimble foam. And uh, we have to take care of a few things. The two uh, solvers they they approach problems from different uh, perspectives. So um, Pimple Foam knows everything about um, um, 
uh, sorry, buoyant pimple foam. Uh, knows everything about temperature, uh, velocity, pressure, and so on. Well, athlete uh, knows things such as uh, mass flow in kilograms per second. Uh, it expresses the temperature in Celsius. So these are also conversions you need to do and um, so on. Uh, another challenge that we had to, to find, for, to, to understand for a while was that athlete is simulating uh, a friction coefficient. So we needed to, to tweak that so that we actually get the, uh, the same uh, pressure loss uh, in both solvers. And uh, in open foam, you have some, um, parameters that you assume constant that uh, athlete is actually computing it since it really um, has a full thermodynamics representation. Okay, and then trying to, to construct two single phase cases that do more or less the same thing. Um, yeah, we arrive at some similar situation here you see a really zoomed in um, version, and this is a manufactured case uh, that generally follows the same, um, the same trend, but of course it's not yet, uh, yet perfect. It is not yet perfect, but this is not an issue for us because um, this will mostly concern the validation cases later, which are actually where we know that we can trust uh, the open form setup that is simulating the same thing with athlete. So this is new, new territory, so we have not really done fluid-fluid coupling before. And you see also here that um, with a single physics model we have in open foam, we're not capturing exactly the same um, pressure behavior. Um, but yeah, still, still the, the two sides uh, affect each other in the, in the right direction. Okay, so the next step here and uh, before we proceed to actual validation cases with uh, uh, where we know what results to, to compare to, is that uh, we need to add uh, conjugate heat transfer. Athlete handles that with uh, heat conduction objects that are essentially attaching on the side of a pipe. And uh, we want to couple this with calculates. And this is now a nice situation because we have coupling not only between two solvers as I had before, but with three. And uh, it's Calculix with Phoenix, with uh, Codester, with anything else that you may have at hand. All right, so um, out a bit and going more to, to, to what is a big picture for, for my PhD is that we want to find a way, a nice way to have black box coupling of solvers of different dimensions, meaning that you have any kind of 3D solver and any kind of 1D solver, and they don't know that they are talking to a solver of a different dimension. Uh, again, in precise, we are doing black box coupling, meaning that you only access the information on the boundary and not um, the internals of the solver. You don't know anything about the gradient. You approximate it, for example, with quasi-Newton methods when you need it. We uh, have uh, written a proceedings paper in the uh, last presence open form workshop in uh, Duisburg. And there is also a poster you can uh, read to, to find more information about the big picture. All the resources are available online. Here, the basic idea is that uh, we are considering different cases of uh, two domains coupled either in series or the one domain is encapsulating the other. And we also need to distinguish between uh, collecting the information from multiple points of the many dimensions to the one uh, point of the few dimensions or spreading the information from the 1D to the, to the 3D. We also talk about here uh, axial and radial mapping. I know that there are different terminologies going around. This is what uh, we found fitting for us. And what else are we trying to do apart from um, this flow-flow uh, coupling? Well, uh, we want to couple 2D and 3D again flows, uh, but uh, coupling, for example, as you see here, open foam with a solid water equation solver. So we have a 3D and a 2D. You can imagine that this uh, could be, you have, a, you have a large scale 
a simulation of the of the ocean and then you have some effects near the coast so you simulate the coast maybe with open foam and the larger scale with uh, some shallow water equation solver this was work of francisco espinosa one of my students and um yeah uh, was already in in a very nice um in a very nice state in uh, another project we are doing we did and uh, my colleagues at the Institute of Helicopter Technology at uh, the Technical University of Munich are still working on that. Um, they are doing FSI simulations of helicopter blades, meaning that you have a 1D um, blade, so a wing, and you have 3D flow around that. They are using uh, even some uh, closed source solvers here, uh, the TAU from the German Aerospace Center, and camera two uh, from the US. And uh, here again, uh, we have to do some conversion from the uh, 1D representation of the blade to the 3D representation of the, uh, of the aerodynamics. And we also had to actually restrict the mapping so that uh, the right 3D regions are mapped to the right 1D regions. This was a uh, work of uh, my student, Kim uh, Huang, uh, in collaboration with Amin Abdel Mullah, who is still uh, working on the bigger uh, project here. In uh, both projects, and also in the one I showed before, we're currently doing uh, all these uh, problem-specific conversions in one in the adapter. But the big picture is that uh, we find enough use cases that we can generalize and put it into the light itself so that as a user you can just write a configuration that says oh you know what i have a um, eggshell uh, spread mapping um, next to my rbf mapping for example so do that automatically this was uh, what i wanted to talk about today and uh, this project is uh, mostly funded by the federal ministry for the environment in germany and the whole uh, precise project has funding mostly from uh, German and European uh, bodies. I don't currently have uh, yet something published on the project with Athlet. However, if you want to read about precise, we recently had a new reference paper. Um, this is at the Open Research Europe, open access, and uh, you can read everything about not only the library itself, but also the complete ecosystem and some software engineering practices that we are, uh, that we are applying. And with this, uh, I see some people uh, taking photos, but uh, you can actually find all the resources uh, in this QR code. You can find my slides. And uh, please, also later today at 1, um, you may want to go to uh, Gavin's talk in the Turbo Machinery session where he's going to show some FSI results uh, using Precise, uh, where we, we try to simulate a wind turbine uh, blade. To sum it up, um, yeah, my goal of this project, that is one small part of my PhD, is uh, to have a flexible coupling of athlete uh, with open form and codes by Precise. It has several challenges since these are codes from completely different communities and they, they use completely different representations. The next steps that we have to do is conjugate fee transfer, more complex scenarios and validation, and of course, integrating everything into precise. My name is Gerasmus Kurdakis, and thank you very much. Yes. And any, any questions? This one. Uh, no, a bit further. The heat transfer? Oh, uh, go. Oh, you mean the problem statement? No. So we have this. Yeah, we're comparing a, um, a single mesh heat transfer thing to coupling. The results, you mean? Yeah. Okay. I assume you mean this oh. one.
Yeah. Uh, what's the um, so that's the very the blue stuff wasn't really the blue uh, aspects. Uh, yes. Um, so one thing here is that uh, I have discussed this results a lot with my collaborators and they are not worried at all um, because uh, this is really a uh, so so small um, range here um, that yeah essentially we need to see actual uh, cases that are validated to, to see if this is um, anything relevant here we are not really making the single physics uh, fit I, I'm not sure in this case um, the, um, the couple cases not following exactly. I assume that the pressure drop really depends on um, yeah, what you get from the other side. Okay. But uh, I'm completely aware that this is, these are very preliminary results we need to improve. Yeah. I still want to show you something. Yes. Uh, my question is, Thank you. Uh, For which one? Okay, okay. So the question is um, maybe I can actually uh, I can leave this slide um, open here. Uh, just to, you can also ask me about uh, specific things here. Um, so the question was, uh, there is this uh, industry standard now, this uh, functional, um, how it's called again, functional object interface? No, uh, the FMI. Um, and uh, if we're considering coupling with that, uh, that's actually a good question. So we are not um, considering workflow coupling meaning that you you do one step then you go to the next simulation step and then do the next one which i believe uh, is what the fmi is mostly targeting uh, but we are mostly considering um, multi-physics simulations of you know you have this repeated uh, time loop and you need to continuously couple uh, multiple models um, but this is a question we get a lot. Maybe we should actually um, make something. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, I'm not sure if you could then really make good use of all the features um, because just put some input is, um, yeah, it's nice, of course, but you don't need all these algorithms for that. So the question from the chat is, uh, how about the coupling to customized open foam solvers? I mean, uh, the, the user defined solver, uh, but not standard solvers. Is that a straightforward process? Uh, yes. So I developed previously in my master's thesis the uh, adapter for open foam and uh, I have made it so that it works essentially with any solver that can work with function objects and that can um, work with a standard fixed value fixed gradient uh, boundary conditions as you're finding your your own classes for thermodynamics that do not derive from the standard open form classes and so on uh, this should work and we have many users that uh, have coupled solvers that i did not know they were working already with uh, with this does work with uh, pimple foam pimple foam when simple foam uh, laplacian foam um, some people have used it within and some people have their own uh, their own extensions Thank you very much. So, hi everyone. Thank you for having me remotely. Uh, my name is Ricard Costa and I'm from the University of Mino. 
Uh, and today I'm going to present you a joint work between Bruno, myself, uh, Professor Francisco Chinesta and João Miguel Nobrega. I must also say that it was supposed to be an introductory presentation to the training session given by Bruno on Monday, but it ended up to happen afterwards. Anyway, I hope you find it useful. And if you didn't attend Bruno's training session, you can watch the recording later to complement my, my presentation. So the work concerns, uh, I would say, very useful semi-automatic approach to verify whether the code you develop in open foam or even the code that is already there is correctly implemented. So why? Um, because uh, as you might know, it's not only about uh, syntax errors, but also about whether the code you implement uh, solves the equations you, you want it to solve. And the most standardized approach people usually use to verify their codes is to rely on exact solutions, usually found in the literature, but uh, they are often limited to simple cases with simple geometries without non-linearities, non et cetera. Uh, and that can prevent you from, uh, let's say, putting your code under stress and be confident that uh, all your solver capabilities are tested and functional. So an alternative and very promising approach is the method of manufactured solutions. Uh, most of you might already know it, um, some of you probably don't. So I'm going to briefly recall it. So basically it consists, I'm sorry, it consists in forcing a function you define to be the exact solution of your problem. So you choose a function and that's gonna be your exact solution at the end of the day uh, by choosing the appropriate soft terms and boundary conditions or if you want, in other words, by solving the problem backwards. So if you have a generic, a generic representation of this uh, system of PDEs or a single PDE where your Ds, your, your differential operators or your differential operators. Um, so the process of using manufacturer solutions is the following. We first define, um, any function you want, usually it shouldn't be um, simple, uh, such as a, poly a polynomial or things like that, unless you really want to use it. If, if that's not your goal, try to choose something different from polynomials, uh, symmetric, periodic functions. And then basically you need to compute your source term, it's step two. So uh, you apply that differential operator to your, ex, uh, ex, uh, to, to your defined solution, your manufactured solution. And then you use the same approach to, to also determine uh, your boundary conditions, Dirichlet, Neumann, Robin, wherever you want to, to use in your, in your solver or in your test case. And then you have uh, your source term, you have your boundary conditions, and for the moment you forget about your manufacturer solution and you solve your problem for your unknown variable T. Uh, and at the end, you have your approximate solution. And now you remember <laughs> that you have your exact manufacturer solution and you can compute your errors and uh, even your convergence orders. So it's simple, but let's give an example. So let's consider the unsteady diffusion of a scalar quantity. It's, it, it corresponds to Laplacian foam. Okay, it's very simple. You have basically two terms in your equation, time derivative and Laplacian for T. T can be temperature, species, whatever you want. And you equip uh, that uh, governing equation with your boundary conditions. I'm only showing Dirichlet and Neumann for simplicity. 
and also um, an initial condition. So notation is quite standard. I'm not going to, to be specific about it. Okay, first step, you define your exact solution or if you want uh, your manufacturer solution. Here we have this case is a trigonometric function of some um, uh, polynomial and you also need to define what is your, your domain. And now we are ready to apply manufacturer solutions method. And first thing you compute your source term. So basically you have two terms in your equation time derivative, Laplacian, you apply those two terms to the manufactured solution and you get your source term with some, I'll say simple algebra in this particular case, okay? Then you can do the same process to get your boundary condition function. So for directly, it's quite simple. It's uh, basically your manufactured solution as it is. For Neumann, you have to compute its gradient and then the dot product with your normal uh, vector on the boundary and you get your Neumann boundary condition function. Okay. So now you have your source term, you have your boundary condition functions. You can in some way plug in it into your solver I'm going to show you how you can do it uh, very conven conveniently. And uh, now you can solve it and you can at the end have your approximate solution. It's obviously a, a discrete solution, one value per cell. And therefore you are ready to compute your discretization error since you know your exact solution. So let's be a bit more specific about it so in first box, we consider what is your approximate solution, okay? Uh, you solve it, it's a complex problem. I cannot write it with an expression. Uh, on the right side, you have your exact value for each cell. So your exact value, uh, since we are dealing with the second order methods in theory, you can choose it to be um, your mean value or the value in the center of mass of the cell. They are actually equivalent for second order methods or up to second order, I would say. And then you can compute the difference, but you don't want, or, or I would say you want a global measure. You don't want to, to put in your paper all the values. So you want just one, two or three values per per case or per mesh, I would say. So you have to compute some norms. And there are some norms that we often find in the literature. Depending on method, you can see this L2 norm, E2. Um, but would, in my opinion, uh, the L1 and L infinity are the right choices because they both together provide a more uh, meaningful uh, analysis of your error distribution. Obviously, if you have a Cartesian mesh, you don't need to, to use the, the volumes. You can simply divide by the number of cells since the volume here works as a weight for each error. But if they are all the same, you can simplify these expressions. But this is what you should use for the for the general case. So we have the error and we know that this error is usually proportional to your characteristic mesh size to a power. So the, the characteristic uh, mesh size is basically a representative measure of the size of the elements in the mesh. And if it's a Cartesian mesh, it corresponds to the side, to the side of one cell, but for the general case, you have to, to have some expression to compute it. And there are also what we call I order terms, uh, but we usually neglect them. If your solver converges, we can neglect them. So you know the error, you know E, you also know H because you know your mesh. So you can have a measure of H, but if you have one mesh, 
you still have two unknowns to determine, C and P. P is what we call the convergence order. That's why one mesh, one simulation, uh, one approximate solution is not enough to define your convergence order. And that's why we need at least two. And we usually define it between each two consecutive finer meshes. So the first thing is to uh, compute what we call this uh, refinement ratio. So it should be the characteristic mesh size of one mesh divided by the other. But usually, since you don't know it, you can have an estimate of it using the number of cells. It's usually a very good estimate. And you also apply this uh, power depending on your problem dimension, OK? And now you have two meshes. You have these refinement ratio. You have two errors. And we can, you can apply these expressions below to compute your convergence order for each of the previous norms I have shown you. So quite simple. And this is uh, most of the theory I have to present you. So let's talk a little bit more about what you have to do in, in practice. So as I have shown you, if you want to implement the method of manufactured solutions in open form, there are pretty much uh, three things you have to do. First is the calculation of the source term to force your manufactured solution to be the exact solution. Second is the calculation of the values or functions of your boundary conditions. And third is the computation of these error norms and convergence orders. Okay, for the first two um, things you have to do, it can be quite cumbersome and error prone since you can choose this manufacturer solution uh, randomly. And as I have said before, you don't want it to be too trivial. You don't want to be a polynomial because then you are making it easier for your solver to, to give you the correct results. You usually want it to be complex enough and therefore doing it manually can be quite um, difficult, as you might understand. Uh, on the other side, for the computation of the error norms, um, usually you, have, you want to do it in the source code. And therefore, it's invasive because you have to change the source code. And therefore, it's also error prone. And also, it's inconvenient. So you don't want to go in that direction. And these are the main motivation for us to develop this semi-automatic approach, OK, to make things easier, to make your life easier. And this is the big picture of this approach. So we can distinguish two steps here. The first one is this uh, calculation of your source terms, uh, boundary conditions, uh, to know what your problem is, I would say. And the second step is uh, what Bruno showed very well on Monday, is how you set up the cases, how you uh, run your cases for several meshes, and then for each one, you compute the error and then the convergence order. So I'm not going into detail about this uh, second part. This is very, uh, I'd say, technical. And I need to leave <laughs> the presentation to show you it in, in, into the code or command line directly. So I'm focusing on this first part. Um, and the first idea we have is to use symbolic computation to compute the source terms and boundary conditions. So uh, you might know that Python has uh, this SymPy package or module. This is a module that you can use to perform symbolic computation. And the idea here is that the user will define um, 
the manufacturer solution. The user will provide some settings such as diffusion coefficient uh, uh, or kind of boundary conditions I want or other coefficients for other uh, models, I don't know. And then for the specific, for the specific coding equation uh, that we want to solve, we will compute the source term, boundary conditions, initial conditions, but in an automatic way. So what it looks like. So I didn't say it before, it's called PI MMES foam. So it's a, it's a package that you can import as I show you on the, on the right side. And uh, basically it's used, as I said, to, to perform this mathematical differentiation and it relies on, on the, on backend, it relies on SimPy. Um, another feature is that this package converts the source term expressions, the boundary conditions expressions into C code. And it actually writes down the all or almost all of the dictionary you need for your uh, open foam case. So as you see in the figure, you can import the package and there are some variables X, Y, Z, T that you, you should import as well to define your expressions, your manufacturer solution. Uh, and then you define it as is in line six, you define some coefficients and this package includes some, or, or I would say the necessary differential operators. EVT for derivative in time, Laplacian divergence, uh, gradient, and you can use it for scalar vector or tensor quantities, obviously when it makes sense, okay? And uh, with that, you can uh, compute very easily with one line, one very simple line, as is in line 10, your source term. So this is your source term. And as I said before, now you can generate these uh, dictionaries as the options for your, um, for your open foam case. Uh, also, another thing is that this SimPy can use what they call common sub expression elimination routine, which is basically used to simplify your mathematical expressions and therefore make your code a bit cleaner and usually more efficient. Uh, it's not usually a concern because uh, OpenFOAM computes these source terms, uh, I mean, for itself very quickly, but if you want to be uh, as optimal as possible, it, it does it for you. So this first function I showed in, in, in the script, generate FE options, it basically uh, generates automatically uh, the, 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 the FE options for the source code, uh, uh, sorry, for the source term uh, that you can put in your open foam case. And it, it's just a excerpt. So uh, it outputs more than that. And it outputs also some comments to, to help you, but I have removed that to, to fit in, in the slide. You also have this function, generate directly boundaries, generate Neumann boundaries that generate your boundary conditions and obviously the associated C code. And then you can copy it into your um, zero folder into the, the variables uh, you, you want. So T in, in this case. So that's why it's called semi and not fully automatic because you have to do this work of copying things from one side to the other, okay? Because it's still not uh, smart enough to do it for you and maybe you don't want it, but it does most of the work um, for you. And finally, to avoid that problem with going into the source code and uh, changing it and making your implementation for computing these errors, you have this generate function object 
that automatically generates a function object to put in your control dict. So uh, when the when the case is compiled, then at the end it will output uh, the norms for your approximate solution. And then it comes the second part that I didn't explain. Then you have to to take or to copy these uh, errors to I don't know an Excel file, and you then you have these errors for I don't know four or five meshes, and you can compute the convergence order for each pair of uh, mesh. Okay, some some references. Uh, I just want to say that. There's actually uh, a paper that was submitted to the Open Form Journal, and it will be published soon, I hope. So you can get more details there, or as I said, ask uh, ask me, ask Bruno or Professor Miguel, and we can give you the details you you want. Okay, and if you want to know more, just scan me, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ricardo. Any questions from the floor? We have one in the chat. Oh, this session is like heaven. <laughs> Perfect. Ricardo, <laughs> I have one question. Could we use your uh, idea for assessing mesh quality. What do you think? Um, I think you can use it, but maybe there are other better ways of doing it. Yeah, it, I mean, you can run your case with several different meshes and check for each of one, each of them, the one that gives you the better and the one that gives you the worst results. Yes, you can do it. Uh, but if your question is about solution quality, that's the answer. And yes, you can do it. If your question is about uh, quality of the mesh in terms of orthogonality, wherever, there are other other things you can you can use. But yes, that's a, a good idea. Okay, I'm asking because we use Laplacian, Laplacian foam for searching for broken meshes. And this is ah, what okay. you put in one of the first slides. Thank you, Ricardo. Any questions now? You're welcome. No. Okay. Thanks, Ricardo. And we are moving on to our last presenter. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let me have a picture of you uh, so that I can put you on the WhatsApp. Smile, Rico. <laughs> uh, and those online, please smile as well. Right. So uh, I'm going to talk about reduced order modeling. And the first time I looked at it is about 2008. I messed it up. Uh, so there has been bits of it in foam extent for a while. And finally, in my third attempt, I made it to work. The mathematics is quite complex. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to explain what we are trying to do. And then we are going to go through the bits to see how it's actually done. The derivation provided in the slides is complete. So in case you need to refer to it, do have a look and you'll see exactly what's going on. Uh, so the idea is that we really like doing CFD, but sometimes CFD is hundreds and thousands of times too slow. So we would like to have an effect of being able to run live CFD simulations, which are orders of magnitude faster than what we're doing right now. And to do that, we want to reduce the general partial differential equation model that we are relying on, which includes everything. The geometry, local mesh resolution, equations, variables, boundary conditions, and most of those parameters can vary in time. So you can change the diffusivity, you can change the boundary condition, you can change the shape of your domain and various other things. And of course, some of that we have to give up in order to run really, really fast. So the reduced order model is a way of basically parameterizing a part of your solution in the way that suits what you're trying to do. Okay, so there is no such thing as a general reduced order model as there is with, for example, Navier-Stokes equations for fluid flow. I'm going to run you through 
two models. The first one is the generic transport equation, because that's where I learned everything that's worth learning. And then the Navier-Stokes equations, which is the problem that I'm trying to look at. This can be further extended. So if you have turbulent flow, combusting flow, free surface flow, etc., your model will get slightly bigger every time, but you should still, in principle, be able to run it hundreds and thousands of times faster. Uh, in the end, I did some validation for Navier stocks and I wanted to do something really hard. So I did moving deforming domain Navier stock simulations with this one. Of course, as you're introducing more and more complexity, your model will get slightly worse and worse, but you will still be able to produce the solutions. So what makes CFD slow? Okay, the variables that we are solving are a function of space and time. And the spatial resolution can be as high as you need it. Okay, so we can run a cavity on 100 cells and get a certain set of results. But if you have a complex geometry or you're looking at the details of the solution, very soon you will end up with millions of cells. And doing anything with millions of numbers is simply too slow. So what we want is to separate the model input and output. So if you look at something like this room, you want to run the air conditioning. Maybe you have a possibility of opening and closing the windows, increasing and decreasing the mass flow rate, and or changing the parameters of the loading. So what we can do is we can say, well, I'm interested in how fast I need to run the air conditioning, considering variable input of heat loading due to the number of people in the room. And I can describe that in many different ways, but basically the model is going to be time dependent, okay? And I have convective and diffusive transport, which is a function of space. Also, there are other things like the shape of the main, which have no room in a fast model because I simply cannot afford it. So once I create this reduced order model, I need to run it and pretend as if I'm running full CFD, although I'm actually running something much simpler. So the first trick that we are going to do is to move from a general model into a specific model. So if I'm doing a reduced order model, I will do it for this room here, and it is not applicable to other rooms of different shape, volume, etc. And the second thing that I will realize is that my variables are a function of space and time, and I can't afford space. So I need to parameterize out the space and just run the model in time. That will create an ordinary differential equations. In fact, a set of coupled nonlinear ordinary differential equations. And I will lose the spatial variation. But the fact that I'm solving ordinary differential equations allow me to do it really quickly. Okay, now please note, I messed this up twice. So the problems that I'm going to look at are going to be very simple. So the problems in this study will be convection and diffusion of passive scalars in a given velocity field, and it will be vortex shedding behind the cylinder. Okay, why is that? Because the method of snapshots that I'm about to present repeats within vortex shedding, and I don't have to worry about whether my basis is appropriate. However, the method is in reality used for other things as well. So if I'm looking at air conditioning of this room, then I can parameterize my boundary condition and say, I will look at the inlet velocity of 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 1, 2, 5 meters per second, whatever you like. And that gives me the parametric space that the model can cover. Okay, so how do we do that? I have my field variable phi and the scalar transport equation with rate of change, convection, diffusion, and source. And I will now do my slow CFD. Okay, so in my case, imagine I have a cylinder. I run the vortex shedding case. I get it into the uh, periodic state. And then I take a number of snapshots. Okay, and the idea is that my ODE will basically move within those snapshots that I consider representative for the field as a set of parameters. Okay, 
So the objective of proper orthogonal decomposition is to go for a bunch of snapshots of field phi into something called psi, which is my functional basis that approximates those snapshots well. The result of it will be that I can take any snapshot, that slide, and I can represent it as a sum of AK of T. This is a single floating point number multiplying the basis field. Okay. And we do that by minimizing a norm that I have here, which basically says that phi dot psi squared divided by psi squared is maximized, meaning that the error is minimal. Okay, so the procedure says you have to define an inner product. Okay, so what that means is you take your vortex shedding simulation with, I don't know, 5,000 cells, and for each snapshot, you have the velocity and pressure in each cell. And now I'm going to do a dot product, which I define as the sum over all cells of one field times the other field. Notice I'm summing up velocities and pressures which don't have the same dimensions. So I may, may wish to cook them a little bit to make sure that they are non-dimensionalized in a particular way. In incompressible flows, not really a problem because even in icofoam, we divide the pressure by the density. Okay, but if you're dealing with velocity of one meter per second and pressure of 101325 Pascal, then you have to do some magic cooking. What I'm going to do next is lead to the eigenvalue problem. CA equals lambda A where C is the correlation matrix. Okay, so if I take 30 snapshots, that matrix C will basically be the product of the first with the second, first with the third, first with the fourth, fourth first with the fourth, fifth, all the way to 20th by 20th matrix. And the matrix is symmetric, okay? Because IJ product is the same with JI, which means that my eigenvalues are real. With the eigenvalues, I will get eigenvectors, AL. And based on this procedure, I can create my phi L, psi L fields, such that they represent each of the snapshots perfectly. Okay? That means that if I take 30 snapshots, I am going to get 30 vectors with the numbers A that I can calculate such that my snapshots reproduce the solution. The snapshots are special because they are eigenvectors of my system, which means that the inner product Ci times Cj is zero. Okay? And that will allow me to create the separation of variables. The second thing that we typically do is we say, I have taken 30 snapshots, but I can reproduce all of the snapshots on the basis, not by using all of the eigenvectors, but maybe using the first five. Okay, so if the accuracy of my first five is 99.99%, .99%, I don't need to carry the other ones. Okay. So what I did here is I created myself an interpolation tool, which based on the snapshots, which are field and scalar coefficients reproduces my solution. Well, that's great, but I don't know A, right? So for the second part of the game, I need to take those snapshots and put them back into the equation that I'm solving. By the way, one uh, very important part of the procedure is that the inner product of the snapshot by itself gives one. Okay, <clears throat> so what you have now, you can think as your finite element basis, but it covers the entire space. Okay, so I give you a finite element basis function, which happened to have 7 million points if my solution had 7 million points in.
and I can recreate my solution field with the entire points by multiplying my snapshots, 7 million points each, with a scalar. Okay? What I need to achieve now is to avoid ever going to the full 7 million cells to do anything because I simply cannot afford it. Okay? So my representation of the solution in the ordinary differential equation will be just this A's here. And now we have to make that solution dance to satisfy the partial differential equation that I'm solving. So let's do that. Okay? Here's my solution. And here is my field phi, which takes this C case. So if I substitute that thing in here, I didn't do anything much. Okay? However, I know a really good trick, which is that C i multiplied by c j is equal to 1 if i equals j, and otherwise it's equal to 0. So I substitute that thing into here, and then multiply it by some other c l, knowing that that will keep one coefficient and kill all the other ones. Got it? So let's do it quickly, term by term. So the first one is, D, d phi by dt multiplied by psi l gives me the sum of a k psi a k psi k by dt multiplied by psi l. Psi k is not a function of time. Psi l is not a function of time. Psi k multiplied by psi l is one if k equals l, so that gives me a k, and zero for all the others. So my DDT is basically the A because I know what these products are. We were lucky this is an easy term. Let's do a harder term, which is the diffusion term. Okay, so what I have now is div gamma grad phi multiplied by psi L. Okay, I cook it again, and the only thing that I know is AK, and these other things are fields. So I am going to have myself an expression which says sum over k to m. I think that's the projector causing trouble. Okay. Multiplied by p Okay. But now, of ck and pcl, I have a product of grad ck and pcl, which is non-zero. But the point about it is, I know PCK, I know PCL, I know how to calculate the product, and I can just multiply this thing, as, thing out. Okay? So in the finite ele elephants, what they do is they apply the Gauss-Green theorem to knock out one order of the gradient, and then have a product of the gradient. But I choose not to do that. Okay? Because basically what I'm doing is the residual of how badly my pck satisfies the diffusion term. And I can do that really well with the finite volume. Just do FVC, colon, colon, Laplacian, gamma times pcl, and multiplied pck multiplied by pcl. Notice, these things here are fields. They are big. Okay? Once I multiply, they are little five or seven by seven, which build my diffusion. Which is basically the same trick. Take the basis, PCK, calculate the convection term by the basis, multiply by PCL, and sum up over all the cells. Well, this is not very painful at all. So the result that I have will be a system of equations, including the boundary conditions, okay? So let's just take a look at the system of equations first, and then we are going to talk about the boundary conditions. So here is my partial differential equation. In fact, it is not a partial differential equation anymore because all of the products of BLM, CL, DL, source, etc., are little five,
and I'm solving Apple system of ordinary differential equations. Okay, that I can do really fast. Now let's go back and talk about the boundary conditions. So my phi of x and t is the sum of a k c k and these things here don't recognize that there were boundary conditions on the original field. Okay, and what does a boundary condition really mean? It means that the sum of psi k multiplied by some scalar needs to evaluate to something special at the boundary. Okay, so basically you can look at it as a constraint on how individual a k's relate to each other. In the partial differential equation that I'm solving, nobody tells me, oh, by the way, you should have satisfied the boundary conditions. Okay? Because I lost them on the way. If you remember, my inner product of two fields only involve the sum over the cells. So what I'm going to do for them is include something called a Lagrange multiplier. And it will basically says I want beta AL PCA PCK PCL to satisfy my PC star, sorry, phi star as a function of time at the Dirichlet boundary. Do you want a cool thing? My basis can be calculated by one value of the velocity on the boundary. And that one I can change during the simulation. So if I start with vortex shedding at Reynolds number 400, I can increase the incoming velocity to Reynolds number 500 and keep the physics going. Okay, can I increase the Reynolds number to 5 million? No, not really, because my basis on the basis of which I have built this simplified system doesn't cover the solution that I will see there. And the effect is kaboom, your ordinary differential solver blows up. So let's just have a quick look of how this operates. Okay, so here on the left hand side, I have transient diffusion with fixed value boundary conditions using CFT. And on the right hand side, I have the solution of the reduced order model. Okay, if you grab a particular time step, they are line on line. Well, this is not very surprising because finite elements like doing diffusion problems and I'm just about as perfect as I can get. The solution is created as a combination of these basis functions. Okay, so my first one is that line here. The second one is the red line. The third one is the green line and the fourth one is the blue line. I don't need many more than that. The property of each of these is that the integral over my domain of that function multiplied by itself is one, and black function multiplied by all the other three is zero. Okay, so this is the property of the orthonormal vectors. Okay, what about the convection of a sine wave? Well, not as pretty because Galerkin projection really doesn't like pure convection. But as you can see, I have a step. It's got a kink in here that I can't help. And the step moves from left to right. And following the discussions that I had before, that is because we need the equivalent of SUPG convection discretization that finite elements are using. And currently I'm using nothing. Okay, does that work in more than 1D? Of course it does. Okay, so again here you have the basis for the POD of convection and convection diffusion transport. And you can see that they are quite wiggly. Here I go all the way to POD 9 because the system does not behave as well for pure convection as it does for pure diffusion. Okay, so what I notice in this part is that my solution drifts. Okay, so as I'm doing a reduced order model, 
the value on the boundary will wobble about. Okay, and that's how I found out that I need to have a stabilization for the inlet boundary condition. And will I do the same stabilization over here? No, because my convection in the finite volume knowledge says the stuff comes from left to right. I have to concentrate on my inlet Dirichlet boundary condition and not worry about my outlet one. So with drift control, I can make this better. So as you can see here, have a transient diff convection diffusion. Drift control holds it here, but the solution is still not perfect. You see it wobbles a little bit below zero, a little bit above one. But considering how fast this runs, I really don't mind. So before we get to more complicated problems, I'd like to point out one more thing. If I do a problem like this, and instead of using 100 cells, I use a 10 million cells, the cost of solving the ODE is still the same, which is nothing. Okay, so it is just calculating those products in orthogonalization that I had to do once. Okay, so here is a 2D transient convection diffusion problem. Just to show you that the thing works, the top one is CFD solver, the bottom one is the ODE solver. And if you're really picky, you will see that I have a very slight uh, sh uh, phase error, which is because I am not quite perfect in the discretization. Okay, <clears throat> so now that we can do a scalar transport equation, by the way, this is my POD basis. So as you can tell, it doesn't look anything like the solution that you would expect because of these requirements on the products that we have. So now that we have done that, let us start doing Navier-Stokes. Well, several problems here. I have two fields, velocity and pressure. Some papers say throw away the pressure field. They're wrong. Okay, I tried, that doesn't work. Other papers say do a decomposition of the velocity independently from the component to the component. The consequence would be that I would have A1 interpolation factor for X, A2 for Y, A3 for Z, and I only have one equation. Okay, so in fact, I have gone through various forms of that system. And here are some papers. Sirovich paper, wonderful talk about POD for recognition of turbulent structures. Grau, the young lady has been sent to Serfax to do a summer project and she wrote a report. It's great, but somebody else was telling her what to do and she could only do a limited number of problems. Then we had people from CISA in uh, Italy who said, well, throw away the pressure term, everything will be fine. And they published a paper with one validation case because none of the other validation cases work. Okay, and finally, we have NOAC. Okay, so the basis is the velocity. And then we are dealing with pressure reconstruction in the way that I have done uh, with the Dirichlet boundary condition using the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so what they say is in order to make it work, we will need to penalize the system to achieve div u equals zero. Don't like that. The reason why I don't like that is that my finite volume solution gives me two representations of the fluxes. One is the cell center velocity. The other one is the phase flux. And for that one, I guarantee you that it is perfect. Okay, so how am I going to penalize if my flux reconstruction is perfect? And finally, Bergman from EPFL says the right thing. Interpolation coefficients, AL, are shared between velocity and pressure. So that means that my complex variable that I'm solving for 
is UX, UI, UZ, and P. And it makes sure that I can reconstruct the pictures of all of them. The second one is the weighting. Okay, so my lower P needs to be a couple, uh, large P over rho, and I can introduce some sort of prefactor to combine between the two of them. And guess what? I don't need to do anything. So before we do that, let us just consider one more possibility. And that is to create a separate velocity basis, okay, with coefficients AU, and a separate pressure basis with the coefficients AP. Now I need two equations. One would be my momentum equation, and the other one would be my pressure equation, and I can make them work together using something like a simple algorithm or a piezo algorithm. But in fact, I didn't need to. So Mr. Bergman wins. Let us go through the various terms of the system and find out the complication. Can anyone guess what the complication is? Exactly. Okay. So the first part is create combined PU snapshots perform orthonormal decomposition and get phi as a vector and psi as a scalar. And note that the interpolation coefficients a, k are identical for velocity and pressure. Now I need only one equation and that is my force balance or the momentum equation. So what I need to do is define the inner product ux times ux plus uy times uy plus uz times uz plus pi times pj and in here in front of pi plus pj i can formally add another parameter to cook with but because i don't know what that parameter should be i decided not ddt term the same so the only one that i have is the convection term okay but notice one thing when I did the decomposition of the velocity, saying a k of t multiplied by c k of t, that thing here is a vector, and I need a phase flux. Well, Chris Maruni taught me that the phase flux and the vector field is the same thing. Okay, it's just that the phase flux is conveniently divergence free, and it is conveniently on the face, so I don't have to interpolate it. So basically, I can use the same mechanism of decomposition to decompose my phase flux into the phase flux basis, where this is now a basis on the faces. And now I can jump into the discrimination of the convection term. So I have div uu multiplied by pcl which is the div of the flux times velocity multiplied by, phi, uh, by uh, phi L. And the only thing that's going to happen to me is I have a double sum. The first sum says AJ FJ, which gives me the reconstruction of the flux. And the second is AK phi K, giving me the velocity U. And I multiply the whole lot with phi L. Okay, so unlike any other matrix, this one has got one dimension higher. But guess what? It's perfect. It perfectly couples the nonlinearity of the convection term. Okay, so I have a triple sum, which means that my CJKL coefficient, which is evaluated as a combination of the flux and two velocity basis fields, needs to be multiplied by KL before I put it back. For all the other terms, everything is the same. And the only one that I have left is the pressure gradient term. For the pressure gradient, I again have the PCK basis. I multiply grad PCK, oh, sorry, I calculate the gradient of CK and dot it with phi L, which is the basis for the vector velocity. Put it all together. The formulation is stable, accurate, and reliable. So why is everybody reporting so many problems 
with POD decomposition and it works for me. If you think about what these expressions are actually doing, is they are calculating the residual of what the snapshot phi k would do to your momentum equation. And because our finite volume is mass conservative and strictly consistent, I can evaluate the residuals really well. Okay? So the problems with stability, etc., are there because the projections of the orthonormal basis for the pressure gradient convection diffusion term in other attempts is polluted by interpolation error, etc. And mine isn't. So let's take some uh, examples. Okay. I had to add the stabilization. And now here you have the full write out of various coefficients. Right. The reason why I wanted to do that was to look at sloshing forces in a tank. Okay? So you have a tank with a different level of fill. During the simulation, you jerk the tank left and right, and you need to be able to give me the reacting sloshing force going sideways. The way to calculate the sloshing force would, of course, be to take my AK coefficient, expand them to the full field level, and integrate the pressure. But I can't afford to do that, because that expansion involves phi k, which has got 7 million numbers. So rather than doing this, I can say that my force on the wall will be AK dS times CK, meaning that I can calculate the prefactor of what's going on with the calculation of the force for one of the orthonormal basis fields at a time. And when I'm done with them, I throw them away. Okay? I can do that for the diffusive force at the wall and the convective force. And then as I'm integrating the ODE, I'm going to get the new A case. And in fact, this is the last bit that stops me from having anything to do with spatial discretization. Okay. So here's one. Vortex shedding CFD. You have seen this simulation a million times. The problem is when I increase the mesh resolution, I have to drop the time step and the whole thing is running really fast, slow. This is the equivalent POD solution. Okay, the most expensive part of it is to expand my AK coefficients into a field that I can make you picture. If I don't do that, I can run a hundred thousand iterations in about a second. Okay, the CFL limitation is approximately the same, but what you can see in the one that's playing is that I didn't use what, Tessa? Drift condition. Okay, so my velocity in the beginning starts low, and as I go later and later, my starting velocity drifts off. Okay, so let's try and do this properly with a drift condition. Okay, so here I have my boundary condition penalty. And now suddenly everything looks pretty and I can run it as long as I like. Let's take a look at an, an, another case. Okay, so just for information, this is what POD modes look like. If you want to be clever about this, the zeroed POD mode should look like the mean value. Okay, and then you're going to have higher and higher oscillation. Okay, but the magnitude will stay the same because the inner product of the mode with itself needs to remain one. 
The top one is CFD. And you can see that it is perfectly regular. The fluctuation is there. And here we have the two methods without drift control. This one has run away and that one stayed approximately the same. Is this good? Well, 510 to the minus 5 is about here. That's about here. So the only thing that I get is a little bit of drift, which is well known. But with drift control, it gets even better than that. Okay? So the solution is not perfect, but it is useful. Okay? So now let's do one, which is highly accurate. Okay, so the idea with this one is that I'm going to make myself a fine mesh and I'm going to take a lot of snapshots. The simulation has been done with about 300 snapshots on about a million and a half cell mesh. You're looking at the POD solution and I can run it for as long as I like. So the only thing that's left is how good is it in the things that matter. On the left-hand side, you have CFD. On the right-hand side, you have POD. The red one is the lift force. The black one is the drag force. And what you can see is that the mean drag is fine, but the fluctuation in drag is too big. I don't really know why. Okay. So moving on from that, this simulation was perfectly stable for half a million integration steps. And then I stopped it because I couldn't be bothered to wait. Okay. So in fact, this is really pretty good in spite of the fact that one of my force fluctuations is out by 100%. So with things like that, the next step is, of course, to try and break it. Okay. And the way that I try to break it is to do a vortex shedding case where the cylinder moves up and down. Okay. So the reason why this would break much more easily than the one before is that it is not perfectly periodic. And the question is, what snapshots do I need to represent my physics? Also, I wanted to do it on a much coarser mesh. And if you look at the simulation, it gets stochastic. Okay, so the cylinder wobbles up and down. And you will notice that the mess in the flow field rather increases. Okay, so this one is not particularly challenging because CFT is going to keep it uh, stable. But with POD, this one is going to blow up after a while. Okay, so let's took, take a look at the forces. Okay, so here I have the POD simulation and the CFD simulation, and somewhere around here it's gone bananas. Why is that? Well, my snapshots are not good enough. There is nothing else that can possibly go wrong. So if I put in more snapshots, made sure that my snapshots were representative of the simulation that I had to do, put a finer mesh to make sure that I have enough dissipation, etc., that solution would get better. Okay, so in summary, this trick of creating ODEs from PDEs using POD decomposition actually works. You have to create a basis which is representative for the kind of problem that you want to solve. And we can integrate these reduced order models into global control algorithms because the coupling towards the outside is never at the field level. It's always force, concentration, mass integral, temperature at the point, what you like, which is a single value, meaning with that we never have to 
expand it to the fields. This whole animal, including all the validation cases that I showed you, is currently in the next release branch of Foam Extend 5.0. Uh, so download it, have a go. I'd love to know what it can do. Thank you for your time. Do we have any questions from the floor? A very good presentation. Do you have any comment on pros or cons versus say machine learning? You kill me, okay? <laughs> but for me, machine learning is regression analysis. This one is interesting. This gives you two more things. The first one is you can find what's important and what's not important. And the second one is that you can enforce your machine learning to be physics aware. Okay, because there are so many people who are using machine learning for cancer patients and for flow around the car. And it is exactly the same machine learning. And I don't think it should be. Okay, but in your particular study, I think doing something like this will tell you what happens with the forces and which are the important response parameters as you move the body closer and further from the surface, which in fact is what you're interested in. Any more? Thank you for, for excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question about uh, the one thing that I No, 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 no. It, it is a fair question, it and I worried about it as well. But in fact, it's here, and it's stupid. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah, this, this one I, I'm not talking about. For example, in, already in the start of the transport equation, mm -hmm. I have a source term. And the source term can be nonlinear. Yeah. And it, if, if I do the projection, then I basically need to evaluate my source term in full space, predict it afterwards. So my question is, so, since you already implemented all of this, like, is there something to take rid of this problem of mine, for example, for chemical kinetics and so on? Okay, so there are two answers here. The first one is that what nonlinearity means is that my AI depends on AJ, AK, and AL. And that means that when evaluating these coupling matrices for the derivative and the Jacobian in ODE, they will depend on A. So that makes them nonlinear. Okay. And as long as you do that consistently, you can pick up nonlinearity in your ordinary differential solve. The other part of nonlinearity, which is the source, and I don't know, the term depends on the temperature, must be coupled for. CFT one, where you took that into account. So you better make sure the snapshots that you choose include this nonlinearity, otherwise you will make this blow up. Okay, then I would need a huge amount of snapshots to do this, right? The most I used was something like 3,000. Okay, it takes one cup of coffee. And then you calculate the interaction matrices write the damn thing out okay so if i want to do my sloshing problem level of fuel in the tank do you know how just jump from one set of cjkls to another set of cjkls that i made with another set of snapshots okay yeah. and you can do linear interpolation okay so in fact there is a lot of freedom and a lot of idea but in reality i didn't explore all of that so I may be wrong. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. There is one in the chat. No. So the, uh, uh, you need to, uh, aha, here we are. It says, does the Lagrange multiplier for the boundary condition mean you have to use a differential algebraic solver for ODE. 
I started by doing Euler integration and that one dies after about 20,000 time steps because no matter how careful you are, you're going to accumulate the temporal discretization error, okay? Runge Kuta 4, Runge Kuta 5 work perfectly. They have a time step limitation, but in fact, it doesn't matter. The one that I use most time is SIBS because it allows me to build a Jacobian and use it in the system. It allows me the time step size, which is 10 times bigger than Runge Kuta, and it just works. Now, SIBS is a pretty advanced solver as ordinary differential equation solver go, but it's no rocket science. So I think the normal ODE solvers will work for you. Okay, and on that note, I would like to thank you one last time on this workshop and let's go and have lunch.